Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I felt like today might be a nice day to go over the eight limbs of yoga. This is a really great resource that I picked up, um, highly recommend it called Pathway to Liberation. Um, and, and we are basing these ideas off of the Yoga Sutras, which are very old ideas, um, authored by Patanjali many, many, many moons ago, but are still really relevant today. And I thought, um, how nice to open up yoga teacher training today and share with everyone that wants to hear uh, our message today. Um, so essentially, I'm going to be going over different chapters of this book, just excerpts um, and expanding on the ideas based on how I view the eight limbs of yoga. And, you know, different people view them different ways, and that's okay. Um, this isn't an attempt to have you see things my way. This is an attempt to share with you my view. And, you know, I think that that's okay. And so hopefully uh, you get a little bit out of this and that you enjoy it. I got this particular book, I think, from my gal pal Yama D. Yama D, is this your book? If so, I owe you a copy because I've been reading it. Uh, if not, I don't know, found it at the studio. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> as we think about the eight limbs of yoga, what we're talking about are ideas for a yogi to live and operate as a in such a way that creates somewhat of a north star when things can be really, really hard to navigate, when the waters get hard to navigate, uh, the eight limbs of yoga oftentimes can be a really great tool. So when in doubt, I recommend the eight limbs of yoga. So just to kind of start off and create a little bit of a template here, I am going to just list them to you and then we'll build on them as we go. And I'll just throw in a little bit about how I use this information, right? And again, this is my opinion and how I use this information. And so um, that's just what I'm sharing with you. Uh, so, okay. So when we talk about the eight limbs of yoga, the yamas being uh, moral precepts. So kind of our social courtesies, um, how we navigate uh, social graces with one another, right? Because it is important. It's important. Uh, humans are really social creatures and we do need each other and it is important. Um, and so the first limb is yamas and the first leg of that is ahimsa and that's nonviolence. So these are presented in order of of, of observation. So first things first, before anything else, and many other things matter, and they count, um, but first things first is nonviolence. So we start there. So any violent, um, not only thing we do, not only action, but in thought, word, and deed. And so the idea behind nonviolence is to not only obviously, you know, not, not bang down your neighbor's door because you disagree with them, but um, not to think about it, right? Or even not to um, beat yourself up about your own personal thoughts. You know, that's also something that you might want to consider, like having kind and loving thoughts for and about yourself as well. A uh, second to that, not first. Second to that is satya, and that's truthfulness. And so this can be tricky business because when we, when we approach the idea of truth, it is important to share truth, but it is also important to honor nonviolence. And so there's a dance there between nonviolence and truthfulness. And this is what I have to say about it. This is my, this is my take. And so if you have a truth, understand that your truth belongs to you and is your truth and is a byproduct of the different experiences that you've had along the way, the culture in which you were brought up, the viewpoints in which you were raised or exposed to along the way, and the experiences that you've had, the conversations, the meetings, the people, the things you've seen, right, is a culmination that brings us to an awareness of what we believe to be our truth. 
and, and and hear the language like what we believe to be our truth doesn't necessarily mean it's true and uh so one, one idea might be try and expose yourself to different points of view to help develop the way you see your truth and then by doing that your truth will be more valuable and able to be shared with others um this one is i think on point to today a little bit and being highlighted because the last time i did a youtube i did uh, on this book it was on a hymn so, so today sacha has a turn and each time i do one of these i highlight one more than the rest and so that's why today is truthfulness and so when we think about what our truth is, um, it is very easy to have our truth reaffirmed, um, especially if we surround ourselves with like-minded people, which humans tend to do. And so even say, let's say social media being the example, and I like social media, I think it's a great way to stay connected with people. Um, but I am, I'm very, very careful not to put myself in an echo chamber or um, only have people on my feed that agree with me or share my same views or share my same um, uh, even moral template, right? And, and the reason for that is that if I do that, then I'm limiting the development of my own awareness of what's going on in the world around me. Um, and I'm limiting the potential of what my truth really is. So what does that mean, right? This echo chamber thing, you know, this is a word that's floating around kind of kind of frequently right now. Um, it definitely certainly got my attention in that the social media algorithms, for example, kind of picking up, want to put you with people that you have things in common with. And so that means if you take a bunch of pictures of food and you share a number of recipes and you check in on restaurants and things like that, the social media algorithms will likely show your newsfeed to people that are interested in those same things and vice versa. And then the idea is then that, oh, we like food. Let's talk about food. Let's, let's visit this social media platform and talk about food together. And that's great because I love food. I'm totally a foodie. I'm absolutely a foodie. I love cooking. I love eating. I love sporting restaurants. All those things sounds great. Um, farm to table is really important to me. Um, responsible agriculture is really important to me. Things like that. Um, but you know, finding what's right for you um, is 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 really what it is. And yesterday I was listening uh, in yoga teacher training. I was listening to a lesson, um, and it was about about having nonviolence against people who don't see things the way you do. And, you know, that was just the other day and now today we're talking about truthfulness. And, and I think that, that there's a dance there, you know, um, if we have people that feel like um, ice cream is better than pie, when clearly pie is better than ice cream, and I have a hundred reasons why I can convince you of such, and maybe even get you to prefer pie over ice cream, right? Because I come with a strong argument and, and, and um, validating information, and maybe I even have statistics and so on. Maybe I go into like uh, how much more nutrient dense pie is, because again, you're coming from fruits and such. We have more, um, more nutrition involved in pie than we do ice cream and so on, right? Like I could probably do a whole lesson on why pie is better than ice cream. And maybe maybe you come to my way of thinking and maybe I feel like, yay, they see that pie is better than ice cream. Check, I did a great job today. But all I really did was fed my own ego by getting you to agree with me. And it's tricky business to say that. So again, circling back to Ahimsa, we're not going to beat ourselves up about the, um, the things we do or the things we say, but we are going to learn from them and we're going to add that to our truthfulness pile, right? So that being said, then, as we, as we navigate over to the next one, it's a stea and that's non-stealing. So if you are telling somebody about why you love pie 
and you're sharing your sacred family recipe and maybe you're even being a little vulnerable and you're talking about like you know your great grandma passed this recipe down and you know then your mother gave it to you and now you're making it for your child and this recipe really means something to you it's meaningful to you and it's part of your core values and it's, it's part of the platform of things that you contribute your persona to, right? Is this family recipe of, of pie? You're trying to share it and somebody else comes in and they start yelling about how using butter is wrong and how awful dairy is and then backing up that argument. So a couple of things have happened here, uh, but the one that I'll point out is non-stealing. And so non-stealing might include not allowing somebody else their turn to speak right? And I've been guilty of it. I've been, I can be like excited to be off the line and I want my next turn to talk and I want to jump in, especially if I feel like I've made a connection with you. I want to jump in and say, oh my gosh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been there and so on. And most people that know me well are like nodding like, yeah, Michelle, we, you know, we see you trying. We see you trying with that. And I am trying with that. Um, and I believe in the moment that it's an okay thing to do largely because I feel like, oh my gosh, I found my people, I found my tribe, let's share thoughts, let's share ideas, let's have connection based on those things. But steady on it because what's happened really to the person that was sharing their a piece of their, their self and their culture and their history and their truth with someone else is that moment was stolen by the person who jumped in and interrupted them. So stealing, stealing, not only stealing stuff, but stealing time. Stealing time is a big deal. Um, another one is venting. Venting, I perceive personally as venting is stealing time. And so um, having been a person that vented the majority of my adult life, okay, I do not walk in unexperienced in the topic of venting. I don't. And I'm going to tag maybe a couple of gal pals that really know this about me just so they can get the amusement that I'm actually having this lesson now here today. But I would, I would, you know, I'd call my gal pal and I vent and I unload. And what happens? I feel better. Oh, I feel better. This is good. I'm so glad that I got this off my chest. Well, where'd it go? You know, where did that negative energy go? That was transferred over the poor person, the poor soul that I just unloaded on, right? And even if they said, no, it's okay, I understand you're just venting and so on, what's that truly really the best use of their time? Me and my venting? Um, maybe was that the best use of my time? Was that the best use of my energy? Could I have used that time and energy maybe to take steps to move away from whatever whatever action was occurring to move away from that. So maybe it's not repeated. Maybe that would have been a better use of my time. And I'm not saying that we don't wanna share our feelings and we don't wanna share our experiences. We do, but that's not the same as venting. I think most people know that. Um, so, you know, without getting caught up on, on slicing the quarter on heads or tails, it's still a quarter. I think most people know what venting is, right? And so um, I invite you, to scale back on venting and try to replace that with um, an open share that observes ahimsa, not harmony, and an open share that observes truthfulness, your truth, and understanding that other people may or may not share your truth. And that's okay. And that really, truly, it really, truly is okay. Um, the next one is brahmacharya. And this one's not that popular because for a long time, it was um, chastity, right? And maybe it is even now, maybe as you watch this video, you're like, it's still chastity. I don't believe that it is still chastity. At this point on this day in this era of time, um, it's more about for me, uh, because I'm sharing these ideas with you based on how I feel about them. For me, um, it's more about not excess, right? Refraining from excess, non-excess. And so um, abstention. And when you think about what that might mean, um, most of the problems that I perceive people having 
um, tends to dance around brahmacharya. It's just too much and whatever it is. Okay. Whatever it is. And so maybe it's too much alcohol, right? Or maybe it's too much, um, TV, or maybe it's too much exercise, or maybe it's too much yoga. I've seen some people abandon their lives and just hide in a yoga class. I've seen it. It for sure happens. I myself have done it. I'm like, I can't deal with reality today. I'm going to yoga class, right? And that's fair. Like that's time for, for wellness and self-healing. And it's time to just kind of like power down and shut off your phone and leave it in your car and unplug and just sit with your feelings, you know, um, so that maybe they're not so charged. And it can be a little bit more, say, productive. Uh, but then that's different than every time things in life get hard, you're headed over to a yoga class, right? And then if yoga classes can't be held for some sort of reason, uh, what now, right? And so that that's a piece of that. And so moderation, everything is moderation. Everything somewhere in the middle um, that's definitely, you know, falls in line with Buddhist philosophy. But most world religions are saying the same thing as far as that goes. So too much of anything, usually not a good thing for the, for the practitioner. In this case, yogi. Uh, the next one is a parigraha, and that's non-possessiveness. And so that might mean that, um, let's use the yoga class as an example, because this is really sweet, actually. Um, you know, yogis come in for class, and some have like a spot. Do you have a spot in yoga class, you know? And so like, that's your spot every week. That's where you put your mat. You're comfortable there. You have your reasons, right? Maybe they're valid. Maybe they are not valid to others, but they're valid to you. Still okay. Right. And then somebody new that's never been there before comes in and gets there before you and takes your spot. And then maybe there's uh, some ahimsa that we need to revisit, maybe some some harsh feelings like, hey, that's my spot. That's where my mat goes. You need to move. That's my spot. That's where I go. And you can't have it. Right. Like whatever transaction might happen. Maybe that whole conversation never takes place with the person that took the spot, uh, but maybe in your own mind. And, and so then what that might look like is either some or all of your yoga class could quite likely be consumed by these um, by these repeating thoughts, this repetition in your mind. Uh, that person took my spot, that's my spot. Now we're doing tree. I like to have the wall so I can hold onto the wall. Now I can't hold onto the wall. Now I can't do tree, right? So the whole idea behind it is it, it creates a platform for suffering. So if what we're trying to do is get away from suffering, which is kind of the goal, right? If we're trying to get away from suffering, um, having that possessive quality and I've had it. I'm a Scorpio. Oh my God. Personality trait. I'm a number eight. There's going to be some of that in my character and that's okay. But going back to that uh, brahmacharya, that excess, keeping it in check. Too much of anything is a bad thing. What's yours is yours. What's mine is mine. You know, that can be honored, but really at the end of it, um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be more joyful to come away from that, that mindset? So it's a mindset right? So maybe the experience, here's an alternate experience. Normally you take the front row next to the wall and you do that because you can see the instructor. Maybe your hearing isn't that good. Like my hearing's not that good. So my hearing isn't that good. I tend to stand up front. Uh, I want to play around with the balance postures, but I also want the support of a wall and that's right there that's nearby. And I like that. And I came in yesterday and, and somebody else was, was where I normally go. So you see that shift there was where, where I normally go. It's not the same as my spot or my damn spot in yoga, right? And so those are two different approaches to the same thing, right? That might be your regular spot, right? Maybe you try a new spot, right? Or maybe you go up and you introduce yourself to the new person and you don't even mention the spot and you let it go right? Maybe, maybe you feel like, well, I'm going to go over to this person. I'm going to talk nice to them, but I'm going to end up with the spot that's, that's still possessiveness guys, you know? So just play around with it as best you will, but begin to see um, the benefits of that. I do recall in yoga teacher training um, many, many moons ago, and even more on, on more than one occasion, I had mentioned that, you know, if, I self-identify with this physical space that is yoga, yoga studio um, in South Neighborville on 87th and Modaf in Modaf Plaza at this address, right? And so if, 
if I identify with that is this is where yoga teacher training takes place. Does that then mean that I can't share yoga teacher training another way? And I remember giving out the example, if something were to happen to this building, could I not do the same thing that I'm doing underneath the willow tree at the park on the other side of the street? And wouldn't that be lovely? And we had already held classes there from time to time. Most of the people in the room were at least familiar with the area or even have had a chance to practice there and have said, oh my gosh, that would just be lovely. I would love that. That would be so nice, right? So consider that just for a brief moment and where we find ourselves today, right? So having that mindset of non-possessiveness of I don't need to possess a physical yoga studio in order to share yoga teacher training really poised me to embrace the shift from in person to online back in March. So, you know, this is good. You know, this is, this is, this is growth. This is a, a, this is something that I'm grateful for. I'm so, 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 so grateful for that because many people can um, attach who they are, their sense of self to an idea, which is also possessiveness. Um, they can attach themselves to um, a cultural um, status quo or political party or something like that. And I think that it's important that we try and bring things back to baseline a little and find some commonality between um, between us. That's a beautiful thing, right? And, and not to try and talk other people into thinking the way we do or seeing the way we do. Um, you know, it's tricky, it's tricky business. I, you know, I've always kind of been a salesperson. You know, I was a salesperson even just like a little kid. You know, I'm definitely a problem solver. Um, I was told, I think I was, I think it was like eight. I think it was like eight years old. And I was looking for the best path home, walking home from school. So what was the best route, you know, and I mapped out in my mind the, you know, the routes available to me, because, you know, chances are there's a handful of obvious routes, you know, these ones are better than those ones and why and so on. And in the end, I came home and, you know, I declared like, okay, I have figured out the best route for me. Uh, I'm going to go this way when I come home from school. And this is why, right. And, you know, I might even get a group of people that live in my neighborhood to go the route that I'm going because clearly it's the best route to go, right? Because I've worked it out in my mind. But maybe, um, maybe, maybe the route that I chose was the route I chose because I mostly want to walk on a flat plane. And maybe that route takes five minutes longer than another route that has more hills. Or another route that's quicker, but it's not a flat plane. So walking on the flat plane is more enjoyable to me and I'm willing to walk for five minutes longer if I can do so on a flat plane. Okay, so this girl doesn't mountain hike. No, Michelle doesn't mountain hike, you know? Like give me a flat sidewalk, you know? That's what I'm looking for, where I can just look around and see the world and I don't have to worry about the path in front of me as much. And, you know, for me, that's just a more joyous event. But that's not everybody. Lots of people would not go the flat plane Lots of people would say that that wasn't as good of a route um, because maybe you don't get to see as many trees or maybe it takes longer or fill in all the different reasons why. So I just want you to consider that perspective is a big thing. And the more we surround ourselves with people that agree with us, the more we end up in this echo chamber. And this echo chamber is a result of, I said something and you agreed with me and it reaffirms what I know is my truth. And therefore it moves me out of that non-access space and moves me towards, you know, this is the end all be all only way around. So just consider it, you know, just consider the possibility. Uh, okay, so next up is niyamas, and those are personal observances. And when I first learned of the yamas and niyamas, um, and that they were to be done in order, so first things first is yamas, first things first, nonviolence that made sense, and then truthfulness right after that that still made sense. Um, I was confused why niyamas, personal observances, would come after that. It didn't make a ton of sense to me uh, because it's my understanding with everything that I've ever been taught is my external world is a result of what's happening within me and my processes. And so 
you know, I would have argued that um, me and my processes has to be worked out before we start bringing in other people to the mix, right? These social graces that we've talked about. Um, and the best answer I ever got, and I said, I'll tell the others. And so I am was, yeah, but it's easier to do it with other people than it is to look to yourself. Ah, oh my gosh. Truth bomb, hashtag truth bomb. Uh, so consider that. Consider that, really, it is easier to point fingers and look to the others um, than to look to yourself. So we'll leave that there. Okay, so the first one is satya or purity. And so in most, um, in most texts, regardless of where, where you live or what faith you might belong to or not belong to, but um, is this idea of purity and what does this mean? Like, you know, take a shower or whatever, but um, you know, it's like cleanliness of thoughts. Like, so what kind of thoughts move their way through your mind? Um, what kind of thoughts live, live inside your energetic body? What kind of ideas settle in your cells? Um, how do your cells respond to that? You know, maybe inflammation, perhaps pain. Um, maybe with pain comes anger right? Maybe with anger comes aggression and so on. And so, you know, there, there is a path, right? And so like, if we tie this one back into thought, word, and deed, what are we thinking? What are we saying? What are we doing? Those all line up, right? And that, I think that's where really where authenticity uh, comes in. And I'm not, I don't, um, I'm not always successful at this, you know, sometimes I fail at this miserably, but you know, I, I, I think that I keep these resources, you know, in arm's reach to try and scale myself back as, as soon as I identify it with love, not beat myself up. So there's the ahimsa yet, maybe uh, consider again, you know, what my truth is and so on, you know, and, and maybe ask myself, is it time to update my truth? You know, like periodically we update our resume or we update our bio or our profile picture, right? And so, you know, maybe there's a time to update your truth based on new experiences and that'd be okay. Um, I think that that is a very courageous thing to do because um, part of our sense of self rests on, you um, certain convictions. And if we're steadfast in those convictions, you know, our ego is very happy because we get to be right. We get to talk other people into thinking the way we do. Um, but I think more than that is allowing yourself to grow and for expansion is really where we start to see, you know, some of those higher tier limbs of yoga that I'll be going over with you guys today. And I hope that this is of value to you. Uh, all right, so the next one, the next niyamas, the next personal observance is santosha, that's contentment. Can we be content? Okay, so some people on this day are content and some people on this day are not content. Okay, and so I think that though this day presents as this day, okay, regardless of um, whether or not you like it, today is today. And so it shows up ready to go for you. What you do with it is up to you. Um, but for those who might spend time or energy saying, you know, if it were only this way, or if it were only that way, um, might not live in a place of action that could, um, that could encourage and initiate growth and expansion and sometimes change, right? Uh, so I get that a lot. Not everybody likes the Michelle show. There's change there because life throws change at me. Uh, I think the nicest compliment I got was last week and somebody had wrote, it really reached me. So it was you, thank you for saying it, um, was, you know, you're, you're like water, you just flow through the change. And, you know, I, I have to say that that's a learned quality. So we, we learn to flow with the change you know, um, and that that can be of benefit and that that's a good thing that shows growth and expansion. Uh, stagnant things usually do not thrive uh, in, in environments, whichever environment you're talking about, my macro, micro, universal, earth, your spot, your, your square footage that you reside at in your home, within your life, you know, those things. Um, 
top is austerity. There is a time for some heat and some work and some things that need to be done. So some things need to be done. Uh, this is not to be confused with, oh, this is what the universe wanted for me. I'm going to kind of just recline back and wait to see what happens now. No, you have to do the work. There's work to be done. So if you want to exact change, there's work to be done. Um, but remember that that is done first and foremost through nonviolence, according to the book nonviolence, then change. So change through nonviolence, right? So sharing your truth um, in that way is so essential. Uh, okay, Svidyaya is that self-study or some, some folks consider spiritual study, depending on, you know, whether or not you take this to a spiritual level is entirely up to you. I tend to leave it out because I find it to be exclusive, not inclusive. So I'll let everyone decide on their own spirituality. Um, I'm just here to share share ideas and hold space for others to grow. Uh, so this Svadhyaya piece is a big piece. Like it, as I've been talking about these namas, yamas and niyamas with you, you know, I've been um, I've been vulnerable and I've shared some shortcomings, right? And some examples that I might have. And I do that with self-love and to say that, hey, I've, I've been in this spot and I've tried it this way and I see for me this, that, the other, right? And so that a big piece of that though is taking the time for self-study. So if you don't have an area of self-study being expressed right now for any reason at all, I don't really care what the reason is, try and implement a structure. So maybe that is each day you journal for two minutes. Everyone has two minutes. To journal. Every, everybody has two minutes to journal. There isn't not two minutes to journal. Um, everyone can find two minutes to journal if, if they really, 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 really want to. And that's where the tapas come in. That's where the heat, the work, the austerity comes in. As I'm going to spend two minutes a day just journaling and that's all I'm going to do. And I'm going to put down, I'm going to do all the other normal things that I do, right? You, you would be surprised the payoff on those two minutes uh, because when you go back later and look at it in a loving way, right? Not with judgment or harshness in the mind, thought, word, or deed. Um, certainly not beating yourself over what you wrote in the journal, but you might begin to start to see patterns arise. And those patterns can be a beautiful insight into the operations of the soul and um, how you operate and understanding yourselves better. And, and that's, I think, uh, the, the springboard for growth and expansion. So consider that if you would. Uh, okay, the next one, Ishvara Pranidana, is um, surrender. Surrender to whom, what, where? Well, that's up to you. Some say God. Um, some say surrender to what is. I say surrender to what is. That's just my own personal truth. You know, surrender at a certain point after you've explored things and you've done your work and your due, due diligence and your duties are finished and you're not just letting the universe take care of things here, at a certain point, there is a time to surrender to what is, right? And so you might have heard me saying this last year, I'm not salmon, I'm not looking to swim upstream, you know, at a certain point, it's like, okay, this is what we're dealing with, and um, how can I position myself for growth and expansion in this environment, right? And this is a lovely place to be. Because I don't want to be salmon. That looks tiring. It doesn't end well for salmon if there's a bear nearby. You know, consider it. Anyway, okay. So the third limb is asana. And these are the postures. So when we think of yoga, yoga class, oftentimes people thinking about yoga teacher training will ask me, you know, I've been practicing a few years and I mean, I, I'm, you know, my practice is growing, but, uh, you know, I can't do head scan or anything else like that. Do you think I'm ready or should I wait? And I try and remind folks that, um, that the asanas, the postures are only one of the eight limbs and they are no less or more important than the others and both. So for folks that say, you know, the asanas isn't even yoga, well, that's not actually true. The postures um, take a very rightful place. It's limb number three of eight. Uh, and they do a good job of working, um, working the excess energy out of the body. 
And this doesn't have to be an athletic bendy thing, right? Like I have literally done yoga between the wall and my bed. So like the sole of my foot's on the bed and my back is on the wall and I'm supported and it just feels so good, you know? So you can have yoga be whatever you want it to be. It can be knees to chest, rocking side to side. It can be reaching for the toes in a playful, happy baby as you rock side to side, you know, on your back, on your mat, looking up, holding onto your toes, rocking side to side and just breathing, right? Maybe sometimes that can still the world a little bit if it seems as though it's spiraling out of control smidge and we might just need a time out. So consider that. Um, I recently learned in the dog psychology course I took because I want to help dogs get adopted. I plan to do that by taking pictures of them and sharing them. So watch out guys, the pictures are coming. But I'm gonna picture, I'm gonna um, feature happy, loving pictures, like, oh, bring me home pictures, right? Cause that's how I do it. And so uh, that's what I'm up to in case you were wondering, uh, cause I'm passionate about that, right? So, but anyway, so dogs shake off. If, if they are in like a, a frightful or fearful setting, something happens, they come out of it and they shake it off. And uh, they're saying that this is the dog's way of like, ridding themselves of that energetic baggage so that they can move on to the next moment. Like, and so it's suggested that dogs don't sit and dwell on what happened 20 minutes ago or what happened an hour ago, you know, and that lends into why you can't, you know, um, you can't um, punish a dog for something they did yesterday. I'd be a little lost because they're a little more present, I think, than people tend to be. So there's that, but that's, that's a training for another day, probably even another course. So anyway, Let's move outside of postures into breath work. And this is the control of the life force, the pranayama, the breath work. Oh my gosh, like it, it's all in the breath. And so depending on what lineage you follow or you subscribe to uh, for yoga, um, I myself follow Kamenov and he followed Deskachar, son of Krishnamacharya, known as the father of yoga. But he... Krishnamacharya had a number of students, Iyengar included, Patavi Joyce included, and these are all very different takes on what yoga looks like. Even what the name of the postures are or the placement of the limbs and feet all basically came from the same guy if you're in the West, right? Not, not worldwide. I'm not going to try and go back 2,000 years here, right? But if you're in the West, Krishnamacharya <clears throat> largely taught most of this most of the students. But what's interesting to me is taught them at different phases of his career from a young man to an old man. And, and along the way, his truths were impacted and changed and a presentation changed. Uh, by the time his son um, came of age to be trained and expressed interest in doing so, Krishnamacharya was heavily uh, invested in things like Ayurveda and self-care and things like that. And But early in his career, when he trained Patabi Joyce, was really more about, um, you know, the athleticism that might have been influenced by gymnastics in Britain that suggested some agree, some disagree, find your own truth. But the, the, the expression of these acrobatic postures that some people associate with yoga would be more along the lines of that lineage if that's what you followed as a student um, and less so of maybe what Edge teaches, right? Because yeah, I'm more about um, Kamenov's teaching of the anatomy of the body what's happening with the body, what's happening with the life force, what's happening with the breath. And long story short, circling back around, Dasa Kachar had said, this is all, it's all in the breath, yoga. The secret to yoga is all in the breath. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that if you have anxiety, um, I'm not a doctor, but I think a, a great start in a moment that you needed a moment would be try and bring yourself to center and find your breath. And then take an action step on what's right for you. But finding that moment of finding breath is just a really great way to still things that might be spiraling. So let's try and find some stillness today. So that's our call to action is some stillness today. We've had lots of vata, we've had lots of air, we've had lots of movement. Let's pull in some kapha, some grounding, 
right? And all the pitta, all the heat can sort of wait. Let's find some grounding right now and let's just all ground and center and breathe today. That's my call to action for you. Ground and center and breathe. Ground and center and breathe. Ground and center and breathe. And that can be simple. You don't know, you don't need any big, heavy, um, techniques for pranayama you don't need a special yoga room to do it if, let's just do it let's just close our eyes <sighs> just take some breaths you know in yoga you inhale through the nose and out through the nose and pilates you inhale through the nose and out the mouth do what you need It could be just as simple as that. Today, I chose breathing out the mouth uh, more in line with the lion's breath to just maybe release some, right? You might find another breath that is right for you. Um, a, a word on breath work, uh, any kind of blood pressure or asthma or anything else like that, just as you would with asana, let's stay away from any extreme movements or breath retention or anything like that, uh, just to help keep us all safe. So uh, that's that's really, really important. Just because you picked up a new technique, you know, online about breath work doesn't mean it's right for you or your health. So uh, it's that's our life force. We need to treat, treat it gently and with love, not, not harming, remember? Uh, all right. And the next is Pratyahara, withdraw from the senses. And so, you know, I often liken this one to the temperature in the room. If it's cold, I can be distracted. I'm thinking about the fact that I'm cold. I'm wondering why I didn't bring a blanket or, or a sweater or a hat. Um, I'll, I'll share a funny story. I, I went as far as calling a venue years ago to see what temperature they kept their venue at so I could decide what I was going to wear. Like they, they were shocked. They couldn't believe I was actually making an inquiry. But to me, it seemed like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Like if it's freezing cold in your restaurant, I mean, you know, I'm going to suit up because, you know, we had an event, we were going to be there and I was hosting the event and I wanted to know what to wear and then to advise others. Like, hey, it tends to be a little chilly. Um, but instead of that, maybe just layer and not be so attached to be comfortable all the time. And so I think the bigger, bigger lesson in Pratyahara in which off from the senses is, is really that idea of not being so comfortable being comfortable. Sometimes we have to be uncomfortable and that provides a springboard for growth and expansion, which is what we're trying to do, right? Or at least what I'm trying to do. Uh, so next up is Dharana. This is concentration. This is often called meditation or savasana in a yoga class, um, but it isn't meditation, it's concentration. So an example of this might be uh, yoga nidra, body scan, um, you know, visual guiding people through an experience while they're on their mats. But the idea of those things is to give the mind something to do, to concentrate on in an effort to teach that muscle how to not allow the mind to just sputter off in any direction it might want to go based on hormones and emotions and chemical reactions happening in the physical body, but rather harness that and say, hey, let's just think about our body skin for a little bit of time. It's a very powerful tool and it's excellent, but it is not the same as Diana, which is meditation. Meditation, according to the eight limbs of yoga, is more about presence, and it isn't void of thought, because I know some folks are concerned about that. It's not void of thought. It's, it's absolute awareness, and so we're not thinking about the body scan, the feet and the forearm, and the finger and the pinky toe, right? We're just open to maybe see a new truth um, and be receptive to what some folks call like a download or an epiphany. You know, you can pick your word and your lineage uh, based on what's right for you. Uh, and all of these things prepare the yogi for samadhi. And so samadhi is called many different things. Um, ultimately, uh, it could be connecting with God. It could be um, absorption. It could be um, bliss. I like bliss. Different folks feel samadhi are um, 
is um, unattainable while on this earthly plane. And that's cool. Some people feel that way. That's, that's good. I don't know that I do. I don't feel that way. I feel like Samadhi, albeit fleeting and perhaps hard to get to, um, is an opportunity to experience bliss based on the daily work we do through the other seven limbs that we've talked about. And albeit, um, reserved for, key moments in one's life, you know, I would liken this to like the moment I gave birth to my son, you know, I would find that to be samadhi. There's other mothers that have said similar things. Um, so let it be what it is for you, but understand that, you know, the ego wants to understand and define things, right? And that reinforces our ego. And that's part of our sense of self. The ego isn't a bad thing. We need the ego, but we also need to keep balance and moderation in that interplay there. So, you know, maybe just hold space and, and carve out um, some of these practices that we've talked to that, or that we've talked on uh, to bring yourself closer towards a state of bliss and joy. And when you find yourself working at a frequency that is bringing you away from bliss and joy, then to consider which one of these limbs might benefit you um, to shift away, to move back again, heading back in the direction of bliss and joy. And uh, bliss and joy, great, very powerful things can happen. Um, I think that um, far more can be done in bliss and joy um, in, in one's journey than, um, than detriment um and peril so with that um this is this amazing book eight limbs of yoga really great i'll continue to go through and break them down in upcoming episodes so head over to youtube at yoga school and arts subscribe so that you don't miss uh some of our other lessons on these really really amazing ideas and i just want to thank you for your time and energy and consideration to hear what i had to say and just remind you that this is just my truth right now in this moment and it's subject to change and that's okay and uh and i honor and hold space for you exactly as you are and where you are and who you are right now Namaste.